Thanks for joining us. If you recently purchased a firearm, took a concealed carry class, or are just curious about self-defense laws across the United States, then you came to the right place. In this video, we will take a high-level look at deadly force self-defense laws. What are the principles that are generally required to be present for a case to be found self-defense? And what does this actually look like by walking through a few examples? Now, as always, keep in mind that laws change with place and time. It is your responsibility to check your local listings about where you are and, of course, when you are. It is your responsibility to stay up to date and aware of any changes. Also, please consider clicking like and to subscribe to our channel if you enjoy this video and if you want to see more content. All right, enough with the lawyer stuff. That's out of the way. Let's go. First, it is important to understand that the law of self-defense is about using force to meet force. It is not about taking life. It is about protecting life. It is not about starting a fight. It's about surviving a fight. It is fundamentally about securing the individual's natural right to exist. While the specific wording of the law will vary somewhat from state to state, there are some general principles that we can study that are common to just about everywhere. Generally speaking, someone can use deadly force in a self-defense when they are confronted with a deadly threat. An individual can also use deadly force to protect someone else if they are facing the same deadly threat. In order to judge whether the situation has risen to a level of becoming a deadly threat, there are generally four things that we look at. Ability, opportunity, action, and standing. Ability is someone's physical ability to act out an attack. If they are securely handcuffed behind their back and shackled to the wall, the odds of them being able to be a deadly threat are slim to none because they have no ability to engage with you to create that deadly force. Opportunity speaks to the circumstances of the incident. If someone has the ability because they are armed with a knife, but they are 100 yards away, they may become a deadly threat later, but they are not a deadly threat right now since they lack the opportunity to harm you in the moment. Action is when the attacker becomes a threat because of, well, their action. This action could be a deadly verbal threat or perhaps a physical movement, such as lunging towards you from a close range with a knife. Lastly, we have the concept of standing. Standing is a legal term that has a broad but important meaning. Everything up until now has dealt with the attacker, but not you. Standing looks at what you have been doing up until the moment that you acted in self-defense. Did you start the fight? If the attacker tried to escape, did you chase him or let him go? If you are in a state that has a duty to retreat, did you legally comply with that duty by exhausting your retreat options before using deadly force? If you broke the law or acted in an unreasonable way, then you may have ruined your standing or your ability to claim self-defense. After all, self-defense is not about starting fights or chasing people. It is only about saving lives by stopping the threat. Without each of these four factors, ability, opportunity, action, and standing, you probably do not have a perfect self-defense case. Now let me translate that for the kids in the back of the room. If you use deadly force without each of the four factors of ability, opportunity, action, and standing, then you might be going to prison for a long time. This also means that in nearly every state, we cannot use deadly force to protect property. It is people defense, not stuff defense. If someone makes a threat to my empty car parked in my driveway, they pull out a hammer and they start hitting it while I'm safely watching from the second floor of my home. That may be awful, maybe a crime, but it's not a deadly threat to me or anyone else, at least in that moment. If you use deadly force to stop the person from damaging your property, you will probably be charged with a serious felony and go to prison. I will not be going into it in this video, but you can often use non-deadly force to defend property. Now, if you do want a video about that, be sure to leave a comment in the comment section below. Before you can really understand self-defense law, it is critical to understand the difference between deadly force and non-deadly force. After all, you need to be able to recognize what is deadly force to know when you can use deadly force and when you cannot. Deadly force is the force that is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm definitions do vary from state to state, but speaking loosely, 
Great bodily harm is referring to when someone suffers a major crippling injury, such as a loss of a limb or organ, whether permanently or just for a good length of time. Some simple examples of deadly force would include shooting at someone, regardless of whether you actually hit them or even if you intended to hit them. Another easy example is stabbing someone with a knife, again, regardless of whether or not you hit them in the chest or in the arm. Deadly force can also be assaulting someone to their face or head. Remember, it does not take a ton of force to seriously injure or kill someone when striking them in the head, whether with an object, the ground, or potentially even your fists alone. Non-deadly force is basically all the force that fails to rise to the level of deadly force. In other words, non-deadly force is the use of force that stops short of becoming deadly force. Obviously, this leaves a lot of room for a gray area about what can be classified as either deadly force or non-deadly force. Let's take a look at this and explore some of these issues in some scenarios. Let's take the example of a punch to the face. A simple punch to the face may not be considered deadly force under most circumstances. I think we can all agree on that. However, the context can completely fuel a change in a judge or jury's opinion. Let's take a large, healthy, and particularly strong man who was about to punch as hard as he could a 100-year-old senior citizen with a long list of health issues. This would rightly be called deadly force by most people. Why? Because it is foreseeable that this could produce death or great bodily harm. If we reverse who is throwing that punch, so now the senior citizen is punching the powerful young man, is that deadly force? It almost certainly would not be deadly force, since it is unlikely that this action would cause death or great bodily harm. If we reflect back on our four factors, the senior citizen would lack the ability to produce deadly force with a punch. As a result, the young man would critically lack one of the four factors and therefore could not use deadly force in self-defense. We can see that in this situation, despite everyone being unarmed, there is a disparity of force factor that demands a closer examination of the facts involved beyond, well, someone is punching someone and that's never deadly force or that's always deadly force. Wrong and wrong. We need to examine the context, or as we call it in the law, the totality of the circumstances, to arrive at the best possible understanding of whether someone was justified when they used deadly force. Now, obviously these examples are rather extreme and create some rather black and white outcomes when we apply the law to the facts. Let's look at something more realistic than scenario one. It's after all unlikely, this side of being on the wrong side of the street in Florida, that you are a healthy young adult and a 100-year-old tries to mug you with a punch. It is more likely that, using published FBI crime statistics, if we were the target of a robbery, that we would be facing an armed attacker, as about 92.5% of victims did in 2020. This may help us to solve the ability factor, because most bad guys have some kind of weapon. The fact that robberies also tend to take place within a handful of feet or even contact distance also solves for the opportunity factor. When the bad guy sticks the gun or knife in your face and issues a deadly threat, this will also likely solve the action factor. And the fact that you were innocently walking to your car and unable to retreat because the attacker cornered you while you were putting your groceries away likely also finally solves the standing factor. With all four factors for self-defense present, this has all the hallmarks of a strong self-defense scenario. Now, what is not the subject for this video is whether you should even try to draw your concealed carry weapon in self-defense against multiple attackers who already have weapons mere inches away from your head. The bottom line is that drawing a firearm may or may not be your best option, depending largely upon your level of training and what opportunities, if any, present themselves for you in the moment. For our purposes in this video, we're safe to stop the discussion at the fact that at the moment when you are cornered, the attacker's weapons come out and they make their deadly threat, you will be legally justified to use deadly force in self-defense. Now, if you do want us to do a video that analyzes the pros and cons, the risks and benefits of drawing on a drawn firearm or close range knife, again, let us know in the comment section below. This scenario is pretty black and white again. 
Let's take a look at one that's going to be a little bit harder. Okay, you are back in the parking lot getting your groceries from the store to your car. You are alone and it is dark out, except for some okay lighting from the overhead parking lot lights. It's maybe 8.30 p.m. at night during the winter in the upper Midwest, something that I know a lot about personally being from Wisconsin. Man is standing next to your car, which is the last car in the parking lot, furthest from the store, wearing a ski mask and holding what appears to be a box cutter with the blade out. Due to some line of sight issues in other cars, you don't notice or see him until you pass a large SUV parked right next to your car with blacked out windows. And suddenly, he's standing on the other side of your cart, about five or so feet away, behind the trunk of your car. You stop and look at each other for a moment. Then without anyone saying anything, you draw and fire your gun, center mass, once, and he turns and runs about 30 feet before collapsing from his fatal wound. Security video footage shows the encounter in surprisingly high resolution and perhaps even more surprisingly with sound. The prosecutor at trial could argue that the individual, while armed with a box cutter and therefore having the ability, and at very close range, therefore possessing the opportunity, never took the action to show their intent, and therefore your door for using deadly force in self-defense never actually opened. Now, never mind the fact that he is a time-time convicted felon and was just released from bail for robbing someone with a box cutter about two weeks ago. Also, the prosecutor points out, it was about five degrees below freezing outside, so the ski mask was appropriate and shouldn't be considered as something unusual in the circumstances. In more technical language, they would be arguing that you were not in the required reasonable fear of imminent death or great bodily harm to use deadly force, because without the action from the man who's now dead, your action was either unreasonable or the threat was not imminent or both. Fundamentally, these are action issues. The prosecutor may also argue that while the state that we're imagining here does not have a duty to retreat law, your ability to retreat or run is part of how a jury can interpret how reasonable or unreasonable your use of deadly force was. Your defense attorney may argue that the combination of the ski mask to hide their face, the box cutter in hand for no particular reason, with the blade extended as well, and the man standing next to your vehicle for no particular reason furthest out from the parking lot spelled out loud and clear the action and their intent that you correctly read when you immediately swung into action. Also, none of the cars in the parking lot were his, but of course you didn't know that at the time when you pulled the trigger along with their criminal record and being out on bail for virtually the identical crime. Your defense attorney also points out that there is no duty to retreat in your state and that if you had tried to run, well, that parking lot may have actually put you in more of harm's way because of all the icy conditions where they saw you stumble actually going out to your car. So how do we decode this? As we noted, this case definitely has two of the four boxes checked, ability and opportunity. The standing issue is not perfect, but it's not really what we're going to be worried about most here. Mainly, we are just talking about action. Was this person an imminent or immediate threat? If they were, then that also addresses why you could not try to flee across the icy parking lot and arguably addresses some of the standing all at the same time. Also, if you want to know more about the laws surrounding firearms versus hand weapons and how distance and proximity play an important factor in self-defense cases, then check out our other video in the description box below because we will not be having time to go into that here. Now, as a defense attorney and former state prosecutor myself, I can safely say that I would really prefer to have someone issue some kind of verbal threat, a lunge, make some sort of movement to show that the man in the ski mask had bad intent. Without any of these, the argument comes down to whether the jury will believe that his mere presence where he was, without seeming any legitimate purpose, how he was dressed, the open box cutter that he was carrying, and if they're allowed to hear it at trial, the man's criminal record may play a factor to basically build in the case for that action element. I am not saying that this is unwinnable. Let me be very clear about that. What I am saying is that it is not black and white. If that fact offends you, then don't shoot the messenger. This is the way the law works, and you need to know and understand it to survive both of your encounters that you actually had that night. The first one being with the man in the ski mask, and the second one being the legal consequences that follow. What do you think about this scenario? 
Do you think it is a good shoot or a bad shoot? Let me know in the comment section below. There are so many issues that we just simply did not have time to address here today. Just some of those include to kind of get your thinking, how do you handle the 911 operator on the phone? How do you handle law enforcement officers when they arrive and ask for a statement? What can you expect from witnesses in a typical self-defense case? What factors, if any, do your social media play to either help you or hurt you? If your attacker has a criminal record, how does that factor into your case and why might a jury not be allowed to hear about it or even learn about it? Now, if you want to hear about any of these specific issues or if you have some of your own, then by now in the video, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. Leave a comment down below. Let me know exactly what you want to hear and why. Again, keep in mind that the law and the specifics of the law change with both place and time. But these overarching four pillars remain in place. Ability, opportunity, action, and standing. Learn them and apply them to fact patterns whenever you hear them, whether it's on the news, in a movie, real life, you name it. Watch and hear, and then you'll be starting to think a lot more like an attorney. If you like this video, please consider clicking like and subscribe. It's not only a great way of saying thank you for the info, but it also helps us with the YouTube search algorithm. Otherwise, again, thanks for watching to the end, and I look forward to seeing you next time.